Hi, this is Soren with Wisdom 2.0, and I'm excited to introduce our next session. It is with Diego Perez, who also goes by the pen name Young Pueblo. You can find him on Instagram and other places. Diego is a writer, a meditator, and a speaker, and he's also the author of the book Inward. He's interviewed by David Seamus, CEO of the Obama Foundation. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Diego, welcome. It's a real joy and a pleasure to be here uh, with you, albeit uh, virtually. It's good to see you and thank you uh, for joining. Likewise, it's really good to be here and it's really good to be talking to you. Diego, you um, over the past few years um, have developed such a, not just a personal practice, but through your writing, uh, you've also shared both your practice and your insight and your wisdom with the world in a way that few other people um, have been able to do. And so there is, um, in some ways you, you have been sharing for a very long time, and, but before we get to that piece, mm -hmm. uh, mindful of this moment in time that all of us are living through, um, tell me, tell us, how have you been and where have you been during this period of time? Um, so overall, I've been doing pretty well. Um, I think this period of time has, above anything else, shown me the value of meditating daily. Um, I, I'm in New York, New York City right now, and I've been mm. in New York City uh, throughout lockdown um, and just through all these ups and downs that we've been experiencing together as a world. And, but it's been interesting, you know, um, have definitely felt a lot of the anxiety and the tension, especially when lockdown started. Um, that everyone else was feeling collectively, but something that stood out uh, pretty clearly was that I was just so grateful to have a technique, to, to mm. have something that, you know, when I feel a lot of anxiety or a lot of tension or worries and whatnot that I could just fall back on and, um, and process, you know, process in a healthy way. And I think to me, that's um, one of the biggest things that I'm, I just feel so much gratitude to have put in the work before, you know, all mm. of these like major crises have happened so that I was, you know, established in the path, like, you know, know how to meditate on my own. I don't always need to go to courses to be, um, you know, to necessarily grow. I can grow at home. Right. And given that you were in New York and for a period of time, mm -hmm. certainly in March and in April, New York City was the epicenter, uh, yeah. literally of the global <laughs> pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so to be there in that moment of time, yeah. um, say a little bit about what that felt like and then how your yeah. practice um, buffeted you during that moment in time. You know, it was such a, it was such an interesting experience because one, it was very insular, you know, it was just me and my wife alone in our apartment. And on the other end, you know, we were listening to the news daily we're going to the supermarket once a week and we're seeing how there was just so much fear in the air, um, especially the first, you know, and the, when the middle of March hit and lockdown began and we would, you know, go to the supermarket, we could see, you know, we were all just so afraid to be around each other to, you know, doing our best to keep our distance. People were, it was at that point where people didn't even have masks yet because the demand mm -hmm you know, exploded and supply could not meet that demand. So um, people are, you know, just figuring out how to like cover themselves up or what's the right thing or should we even use masks at this point? Um, so the between confusion and fear is where everybody sat. <laughs> and it um, in New York City, especially just watching the numbers go up, not only the cases, but the amount of people who passed away because of the virus. And I mean, the number is, strikingly high. I mean, I think I checked the number the other day, it's around in New York City alone, about 23,000 people passed away. And that's humongous, especially for a city that has gone through so much, you know, I think in 9-11, um, it was about 3,000 people that passed away. So the magnitude of that is so much bigger. And it got to a point where, you know, around April, like not only was my family going through its own experience with COVID because my uncle who lives in Ecuador, um, mm he got the, the virus and actually ended up passing away from it. But oh, I'm sorry, Diego. 
yeah, it was really, it was a, definitely a very tough thing for my family. Um, and we dealt with it as best as we could, but there was a sense of community in the loss because I wasn't the only person, you know, my, my other friends, like a lot of them either lost a parent or an uncle or someone they had worked with, or, you know, that literally like it, it, in New York city, especially it became the type of situation where it felt like everyone knew somebody who was either in the hospital in a serious condition or had already passed away. And that really um, not only reinforced that sense of community, but just made the whole COVID experience very real where I know in other parts of the country, it hadn't quite as hit as hard yet, but we were, you know, we really got to experience that very viscerally in the beginning. Diego, you mentioned a few seconds ago, a few moments ago about fear. Mm -hmm. um, and so presumably there is a different quality, a different tone to the fear, the sadness, the anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, dependent, depending upon how close in some ways the person is to you. So mm -hmm. you hear that your uncle has COVID and then you hear your uncle pass uh, mm -hmm. away. You know people around you who have COVID and that there are thousands upon thousands of people who pass away. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit if you could about your practice and how regardless of the tone or the quality mm -hmm. of what you were feeling, how you met that moment and how you were present with that uh, and how it helped you. Yeah, it was interesting because that whole experience of COVID helped me see where I was, like where I've made progress in my practice and also other areas where I could grow in. And, you know, my uncle, so I grew up here in the United States. My family came here when we were, we decided to come here when we were about, I was about four years old, 1982. We got to this country and, um, but my uncle, he lived, he lived in Ecuador. So I got to see him very sparingly. And to me, he was a figure that, um, you know, he was my, my mother's brother and they were closest in age together. So he was mm. such an important part of her life. So through her, we got to hear so many stories about him. And I also, when I visited Ecuador, got to spend my own time with him, an, an amazing person. He was a fireman and, um, you know, literally saved countless of people's lives, so many lives. Um, but when we were going through that experience, like him initially having to go to the hospital, you know, his son finding him at his home and he was like unable to get up, immediately needed, you know, real professional assistance. Um, they took him to the hospital and then uh, slowly his situation deteriorated and he wasn't able to get better. But then processing that as a family, even though, you know, my family, they live in Boston and I live in New York City. So doing that from afar, and just being there as support for my mother, who I knew above all of us, even though we were all hurting, um, she was the one who was feeling it the most because of her deep, deep bond that she had with him. But in my practice, it was interesting because um, I not only felt the sadness and was able to just sit with it, you know, because you don't want to really suppress it, um, but you also don't want to necessarily fuel that fire of inner tension. Mm -hmm. You just want to be with it. And, um, and having that, practice and knowledge of how to sit with myself um, really helped me show up for my mom and my family in in some very um, real ways and to just like be like the emotional backbone for my family in, in some ways and that um, I was glad you know I was so glad to be able to have that um, just ability to help my mom see it through mm. yeah Diego your 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 practice Mm -hmm. um, yeah, even before COVID, uh, say a little bit for all of us about what is your practice? Um, what does it sure, look sure. like? And, uh, and then finish by uh, describing the gaps mm -hmm. that you think this moment uh, illustrated um, in areas where you have to dig a little bit deeper as all of us do. Oh, sure, for sure. You. I think... Um... I think one, one of the areas that I definitely see is that a lot of my suffering is it originates in my sense of, of I, of Diego, of um, this like a uh, narration, this 
story that I've created of who I am and what I like and what I, what I want to continue to exist. Mm. Um, so literally the like enmeshing of my attachments around this sense of I. And I, so I practice Vipassana. Um, and Vipassana is a, a technique that um, I learned through uh, basically S.N. Goenka. S.N. Goenka, you know, I've never met him personally, but he's the, the global Vipassana teacher for our organization. And he's a Burmese man of Indian descent who um, really helped this, uh, the Buddha Dhamma or like uh, mindfulness as we know it today in America just expand out into the world. And um, this teaching was something that I got it. I did my first silent 10 day course in that tradition in July of 2012. Mm. And that was just absolutely life-changing. Like I, you know, I was always looking for something and I didn't quite know what it was. And I realized that all of my life I was looking, I thought I was searching for knowledge but what I was really looking for was wisdom. And this was a type of thing that you couldn't, you know, to really experience it for that wisdom to really be your own. You had to experience it within your body, within your mind. You couldn't necessarily read about it. And um, I'd spent so much of my life like reading, reading and studying and looking. And um, when I actually connected with this practice, I felt the difference. The difference was immense. You know, I, um, I really felt like even in those first 10 days, I felt like I learned more than I mm. had in four years of college by far. Mm. Mm. But, um, but that practice has, you know, that was 2012. And um, what that looks like for me daily is I sit an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening, um, both my wife and I do. And we've been doing that for about five years now. And um, mm. it's made such a dramatic, radical difference in our lives. You know, who I was when I started to who I am now, it could be two different lifetimes. And, and Diego, while you're sitting for those two hours during the day in the midst of the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, understanding and experiencing what's happening with your uncle and with mm -hmm. tens of thousands around you in New York, um, if you're comfortable, how during the practice, yeah, with all of this happening around you, what is the experience and then... Um, from a Vipassana perspective, how are you meeting what you are mm -hmm. feeling at that moment? I think it's, um, it's a, I, what I've really found and learned is it's all about acceptance, right? You're, you're, not, you're not trying to necessarily cultivate a particular way of being when you're meditating. You're really just trying to observe like what is actually happening. So if in a moment you're feeling tension, you're feeling it and you're you know, going through the process of just feeling these changes in the body, um, while your emotions are just going through their ups and downs and that ability to meet myself with a real sense of radical honesty where you know okay right and especially in the very beginning of COVID I remember my wife and I felt so unsettled because one like you know we were some of the first people to experience going to the supermarket and half of the supermarket being empty you know there was like in the beginning there was it wasn't just that it like toilet paper and all these things were gone. It was like food. Yeah. There was literally half of it was empty. And seeing that, um, especially like growing up in, a, in the United States where whether you have money or not, the supermarkets look abundant. And yeah. it's so whether you have access to that or not, you know, depending on your like socioeconomic situation is another matter, but the supermarkets generally look, up, look abundant. But then not only knowing that, you know, even if you may have money, you may not get what you want. So experiencing that was um, just such a big smack of reality that like, even though a situation may have been like that for, you know, 60, 100 years, there could be a sudden change where it isn't like that anymore. And times could become mm. more scarce, things become more difficult. So yeah. the practice really has us meet impermanence in its fullness, right? Everything that arises passes away. So being able to take that into our daily lives and realizing that, okay, we had such a period of calm before and now we're in a period of a bit of chaos and things are just changing really rapidly and collectively we're figuring out how we're gonna deal with this challenge. But that's also okay because this challenge in and of itself, even though who knows how long it'll take for us to come out on the other end, a year, two years, three years or four years, eventually that will also change and there will be a different situation. But this acceptance of change, this like embrace of change allowed 
my wife and I to deal with our immediate sense of being unsettled, but then also realize, okay, now it's time for us to adapt. How are we going to meet the situation? How are we going to continue moving forward with our lives and supporting those, those around us? And we found mm-hmm. that um, we, you know, without the practice, we would have been way, way more anxious. And, and there is, as you and I have discussed before, there is a, there is a clarity of mind mm-hmm. at that moment that allows you to see um, in a way that you're not too high, you're not too low. Right, right. And to try to be as objective in that moment about what objective reality is, mm-hmm. um, which leads to the next um, piece that I'd like you to dig into a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, you previously said to me, and it fits in this context perfectly, I think, Diego, is um, in order to heal, for the healing to begin, mm-hmm. The, the problem or the challenge has to be seen and it has to be seen with clarity. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what did you see um, oh. in this moment in time? <laughs> so much. I think um, it's interesting because even before I started meditating, um, when I, I had about a year where from 2011 to 2012, where I was just practicing honesty with myself. And I got to see the sides, all the different sides of myself in a way where I wasn't running away from them anymore. I wasn't trying to fight them, fight them or hide them. I just simply um, was able to just see, okay, these are the, the parts about myself that I like. These are the other more rough parts of myself that I need to deal with. And when I started meditating and finding a way to process all of that, it became so clear that, you know, before I could even make any of these changes before I could even put myself in a deconditioning process, I had to just simply accept this is where I'm at. And what I started seeing was that the world was going through this same motion where so much that seemed a bit unclear, where some people might have understood it, but generally the populace at large, um, there was a lack of clarity around where we were really at, especially with our healthcare systems. And then even when you move forward to what's, what's happened recently with the Black Lives Matters protests, this whole period and um, of COVID kind of ignited a sense of we're not done yet. We're not as far along as we thought we have been, especially in regards to our human rights and to healthcare accessibility and to dealing with structural racism. These are things that as a society, we need to accept that they are there. And the moment that we can accept that they are there, we can start actually doing that work to peel back those layers and start fermenting a new sense of um, structural compassion. I think out of this whole period of COVID, the term structural compassion became really real to me because one thing that we get out of meditating is a a greater sense of patience and tolerance with each other and also a sense of being able to just simply put myself in your shoes so I can better understand your perspective. Like that's what I really think compassion is. And now, which we need to figure out, and I think I really think it's our task for the 21st century as human beings, is how can we make compassion structural? How can we elevate it to a new level where it's not just interpersonal, but we actually have compassion in our organizations, in our communities, in our cities, in our nations? How can we interact with each other in a way that is just much, much less harmful and much, much um, in support of real human rights? Right. How do you how do you essentially scale that? Exactly. How um, do you scale in it? In a up? way, right. Um, and before you even get to that question of scaling, and I love the phrase, Diego, structural compassion. Mm-hmm. Um, what are when you look at that clearly? Um, and I know that this is a beginning of a journey for you and for mm-hmm. for many others. Um, what are some of the inhibitors? What are what are some of the, the mind states, the uh, defilements, describe them as you will, that are inhibitors to getting to that sense of structural compassion? What can you see clearly into that mm-hmm. in order to, in some ways, reverse engineer mm-hmm. um, what needs to be done? I think one of the major hurdles is 
uh, greed-based and fear-based conditioning where we have such a mindset of scarcity that we can only think about our immediate short-term what's happening right in front of us. And we can't yet make that full connection into seeing that I would actually be better off if the people around me also shared in a particular type of abundance. If they're doing well, then my likelihood of doing well would increase. And I think right now we're shifting into that mindset where we're starting to almost collectively do that deconditioning work that we would do privately on the cushion. Because that's what you end up finding. And it happens to so many people is that they start meditating and so many layers that they've built over time in this mm -hmm. lifetime, so many reactions of fear, um, reactions of, of tension generally. When you start peeling that away and it starts sort of evaporating from the mind, what do you end up finding? You find this like well of compassion, this well of love, this, this, um, this patience, this tolerance, this new sense of creativity that you then use to, you, you almost use that as a medium to engage with people in a much deeper way, in a way that's much more communicative, much more, it's much deeper. And um, you have a new ability to just build better results that benefit the both of you. And one thing that really became quite clear was, especially during the COVID experience in New York City, was there were so many um, articles and so many stories about how there was just a massive um, disadvantage with people who lived in particular parts of the city and had worse access to healthcare. And that just shined a light so clearly on the fact that these gross disparities of healthcare, though they may be racial or economic, they don't, they don't quite make sense and they shouldn't continue happening, especially when if you realize someone who's at the top of the privilege ladder, it's literally to your benefit for your neighbors to be healthy, especially in a COVID viral type situation. If my, if the people, though I may not know them, they should also have access to great health care because if they have access to great health care, then the chances of me and my family being healthy have increased. And seeing that connection that is literally to your benefit for other people to do well in such a tangible material way, um, watching that play out in the city, just, you know, was shined a light on how we can make our material conditions much more compassionate and pretty quickly. Um, because we do have the resource, but it's more so a matter of, um, I think, a mixture of political will and courage. Yeah. And um, in some ways in, in healthcare, uh, certainly in a pandemic situation, the, the ability to connect the dot mm -hmm. between the well-being and um, the good health of someone in a part of New York that's been devastated versus someone in a part of New York that hasn't felt the same way. Right. It's, it's easier to make the connection. When you look at and you referred to the protests um, that erupted in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and others, um, how about in that context? Where does, um, what are the inhibitors there to structural compassion? And where there do we see that interdependence um, that's so clear mm -hmm. in one context, mm -hmm. but may not be clear to some in the other. How do you think about that? I think that one of the things that could help us the most as a civilization, as, as human beings in general, especially this century, is dealing with our inability to think long-term and also our inability to really embrace complexity. And when you think about that within American history, you know, there are so many people who wished we lived in a post-racial society, who wish we had overcome racism to the point where they're not deeply engaging with the statistics of what's actually happening in the United States, especially for, for Black people who deal with the worst aspects of structural racism. And I'm, you know, I'm a Latinx man. So like I've also have dealt with my degree of racism and have dealt with not only the white supremacy that's been embedded in my mind, but the actual, like the instances where I've engaged with police or the instances where I've like, you know, have felt the structures of society imposing themselves on me and, you know, just getting me totally wrong. There's one story that kept, keeps coming up. Um, mm. When I was applying to college 
And uh, I went to my guidance counselor with my list of 11 schools that I wanted to apply to. My guidance counselor, and she was a very nice woman, right? She wasn't malicious, but yeah. the conditioning that she had in her mind, she outright just told me like, you're not gonna get into these schools. You know, you're not, th this isn't even worth your time or your money. Like don't, you know, you need to apply to a whole tier lower. And I looked at her and was like, I didn't really know what was going on. You know, I was like, okay, like you can think that, but I'm just gonna do my thing. And then I, I, I ended up applying to all those schools and I got into 10 of them. She was totally wrong. She was totally wrong, but because she saw me come in um, and I think, you know, mainly just my brown skin was that she was just like this, this, this dude needs to not, you know, aim so high. And that's that structural racism, right? And though it comes in so many layers, you see it in so many different ways. And we know, right, like black Americans have it the worst, like they, they deal with racism on such a severe level that is, it's just utterly inhumane. And it's good that this came to light. I think a lot of people, you know, they fear protests, but if you examine history, when people move together, history changes. If you take a look at like all, so many of the things that we enjoy, the, 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 the privileges and the rights, like people had to move together and stand up and say, these are the changes we want to see made. And mm -hmm. after that, the changes happen. But first, before you can even know how things are going to change, you need to just understand what's happening and accept it, and then you can change it. It's almost always, uh, Diego, bottom up, um, mm -hmm. certainly in the United States, but, but in other places. I, I'm really intrigued by the story of your guidance counselor. It's, a very, it's similar to a story that Michelle Obama tells of uh, going to her guidance counselor. Really, I don't know uh, this. in high school, and and saying that she wanted to go to Princeton, mm -hmm. uh, and the guidance counselor, similar to your experience, said, "No, mm -mm. Yeah. you should be thinking about something else." And uh, that story has written itself. How would you go back to that guidance counselor today? You know, I would uh, deal with it. And yeah. what would you say to her? I mean, she saw the results herself. Like she, yeah. she knew what schools we got in by the time April, May came, you know, we all had our names up on the wall, how a lot of high schools do, what schools we got into. And um, so she saw it. And I just hope that um, she may have taken the learning upon herself as a lot of white people have to do, you know, just expand your sense of what is happening, what has happened in history and what's actually still happening. What are these reverberations that we're still feeling now? And um, if we ever have a conversation about it, I, you know, I'd be more than happy to talk and just be really compassionate because trust me, ignorance is rampant throughout society and she's not the only one. I have tons of ignorance inside of myself. What you're doing when you're meditating and sitting on the cushion is coming across your own ignorance and creating more space in your mind so you can handle more perspectives. So I understand, you know, like it's not, um, it's not necessarily that people are malicious. They just don't fully understand or can appreciate other people's perspectives. Yeah. There's a story that they have constructed mm -hmm. uh, that creates that delusion mm -hmm. and clouds. Um, but there's a really important thing, at least for me, that you just said there, and you've said it now a couple of times, Diego, where you're not going to as it relates to her, make any assessment of her motives or mm. her intentions. You know what the outcome is. Right, right. Um, but that creates that space in some ways mm -hmm. for the subsequent conversation or series of conversations where understanding your ignorance and her ignorance and the way it manifests, um, that you can engage in a compassionate conversation with someone uh, in that way. Um, you're writing, you write a lot. I do. I've been, I've gone through uh, a writing COVID period it's, so much. <laughs> and it's, and it's beautiful, at least what, uh, I and the rest of the world have seen. Um, has COVID changed your writing in what I you write so. about? I think so. Um, I, I really feel, and I think this happened for a lot of the internet 
is that a lot of people who are creating content, whether they were writers or whatnot, whatever it was they were doing online, um, COVID became such a real experience that it opened our sense of what we could talk about. So not only you know, do you talk about your typical topics, but you're expanding and being like, hey, I'm a human being. I'm also going through this. I'm also afraid. I'm trying to navigate this as well. And I felt that opening, it felt like a fresh, uh, sorry, um, it felt like taking in a really deep breath um, because so many of us get trapped in our little silos and our little like, you know, circles and niches of what we're working on, which is all well and great. But the reality is that human society is so complex. And the more that we're able to appreciate this complexity of our experiences, the more we're, we're going to be able to integrate that in a way where the actions we decide to take are just so much more effective and inclusive and, um, you know, just have that long-term view that we really need to be successful. Um, but I've been enjoying it because it's allowed me to connect um, the dots from the internal to the external in the way I really wanted to. Because the reason I started even the idea of Young Pueblo, it's so funny because like so many people think that's my name. It's not, you know, my name is Diego Perez <laughs> and Young Pueblo isn't even it's an idea, right? It's the idea that humanity is young, that we are all young people, that we all have so much to learn. And, and particularly that in this century, we're going to have to mature because our challenges are so great. But at my, um, especially coming from the activist background that I grew up in, it became so clear that to be able to really come up with these creative solutions that we need, to have the courage to deal with these tasks we need to deal with what's happening in our own minds so that we're not so immediately reactive so that our perception isn't so deeply encoded with what's happening, what's happened to our personal, to mm -hmm. what's happened to us in our own past. Because so much of the time we don't realize how the past just has a grip on our present and we can't quite see what's happening in front of us because everything that we're processing is just going through this filter that was built in the past. How much is Young Pueblo um, an unfiltered um, expression of Diego Perez? How are Diego Perez and Young Pueblo different? Oh, it's, I think very similar and also pretty different. I mean, um, I think I, I write a lot about the personal and the interpersonal. I write about the possibility for personal transformation, how how difficult the journey can be sometimes, how rewarding it could be if you continue with your determination, putting effort into it. And I've been writing a lot about relationship because I know that the way that we treat each other in our friendships, in our you know, family relationships or in our more intimate relationships, that will then spread out into society and in the, in the ways that we end up treating each other. So if we are able to, you know, deal with our relationships and our intimate relationships much more compassionately, then there's a much greater chance that we're gonna be able to be a little more compassionate at our jobs, to be a little more compassionate in our cities and in our countries. So I've, my work feels a bit um, just really focused in these two areas at the moment, but in my personal life, I mean, I read a lot of politics. Like I read a lot of history. Mm. I'm always, um, one of my favorite subjects is uh, big history where you're trying to examine not only what happened in physics and biology, but you're trying to see how that connects with human society and where as a humanity, we're all moving forward. Um, like the work of David Christensen, um, there, you know, there's so many great people out there, even Yuval Noah Harari does this mm -hmm. a big history type work, but um, trying to see the bigger picture and where we're going is generally where my mind's at. Um, mm -hmm. But I know how valuable it is to write about that personal development, because that personal development, that's what's going to end up helping us build that better future. And for the tens and hundreds of thousands who are exposed to you writing about a personal, uh, about personal development, um, it's one of the fascinating things for me about social media is that um, it is an expression of what is best and what is worst about the human condition <laughs> and in its full glory and infamy all at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, 
Have there been instances where right before hitting send, mm -hmm. you said, this isn't right. And uh, while it may feel right to me, I don't mm -hmm. know how this will land. Yeah. I give myself a lot of flexibility now. Um, I, you know, sometimes I will put something up and just give it five minutes just to see, is this message really reaching people? Is this, um, like, am I using the right words to really connect this idea and allow it to germinate properly, like in the internet? And um, I'll sometimes do these little experiments where I'll, I'll let a piece up there for like five or seven minutes and just see, you know, what the comments are like and what so to just kind of hone my own craft and then kind of mm -hmm. I'll take it off and be like, because there, there are these long, you know, I'll go through these processes where these ideas will have to germinate within my own mind for so long for them to be really mature enough to share with other people. But I'll, but through that process, I'm basically writing the same thing in a lot of different ways. Like how, how am I gonna get this particular idea to really connect with people? And um, so I, I definitely let that happen. And there are times where I write something and, um, and I'm like, you know what? I could have said that better. So I'm gonna take that down and, re and try to do that one again. And, and it's great. I really love it because that having that immediate feedback um, mm -hmm. and also just understanding that Right. So a lot of the topics that I write about, like I'm not creating these topics, right? This is like the human condition has been studied over and over and over since the moment that we could write and talk. So what I offer to people is my own experience of these things. And that's something that I always try to make sure that I'm not writing about something that I'm not experiencing because only when I'm really experiencing it, then do I have a right to disseminate any information around that. So I don't, I don't write about what I read about, right? Like I, it, it has to be experienced. There is a care um, that I think is directly related to the, to the reality of the internet and to social media more specifically around the words and the themes and the expressions that even with the best of intentions mm -hmm. that we put out, we really don't know how they land and yeah. in service of what they are used. And so mm -hmm. I love that the, the care, the responsibility mm -hmm. that you bring to those moments. How about vanity and ego? Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about the moments where when something explodes online mm -hmm. uh, and the moments when something doesn't where does to the extent that it does i don't want to presume mm -hmm. um, but this is a struggle that we have as humans um, how do you deal with that with fame with notoriety with wow that got x yeah. i feel uh i love this question because i talk about it with my wife a lot and um mm -hmm. i feel like young pueblo is very famous <laughs> but Diego Perez, you know, nobody knows that guy. Like, uh, it's so rare where I, I think that within the Wisdom 2.0 world, um, mm -hmm. I allow the two to be connected very clearly. And when I go on podcasts or do interviews, um, you know, I'm very open. I'm not like hiding my name, but it's, I, I use the pen name very intentionally because I like my life having privacy. And also I'm not trying to make myself and my image greater. I, what I'm really trying to highlight is focus on this black and white image and focus on the meaning of the words. And what does that, does that hopefully make you see a little bit more of yourself? And that's what I'd rather highlight than like make myself famous. You know, that's not my goal. Um, but in regards to attachment to the work, you know, there's, I'm not fully liberated. So there's definitely attachment. Attachment's not gonna go away until the very end. Um, but I love that because having my work highlight where I need to grow, you know, I appreciate that. I want to see where my attachments are so I can work on deepening that deconditioning. Cause one thing that I've, um, made it really clear, especially to my wife, like, I'm like, I don't like having my work cause my highs and lows. Like, I don't like having my work. Like if I do a great job and I feel really great about that. 
you know, it's fine to notice that you're, you're having a really, you know, you, you did a great job. That's the point, you know, you're supposed to try to do your best, but to be so attached to that, where you can just swing up and down, depending on how your work is going, to me, that, that feels unhealthy. And I'd rather have a much more balanced and detached approach to the work so that I can create for the sake of hopefully help me, helping someone that it's really connecting with, as opposed to like my own, you know, like adding to myself in some way or making myself greater, because that is not gonna help my own liberation. And this is something that I came into the work with to be really candid. Um, when I started writing, I knew I was like, okay, if this starts getting in the way of my practice, if this starts getting in the way of my freedom, um, of me cultivating my freedom and really walking down the path, um, then I'm just gonna, I'm gonna need to drop this. So I actually am very intentional about not taking too many interviews, not taking too many projects, not taking too, too many things because like granted, yeah, I do want people to like read my book and like to read my future books that are coming out. But I also don't want to be so busy, so um, focused on getting myself out there that it just gets in the way of me, you know, having access to go to retreats, to be able to meditate more, to be able to find those quiet times where I can really learn more about reality, as opposed to like feeding the idea of Diego in Young Pueblo. Right, right. Yeah, look, it, um, it's a really interesting and wonderful answer about uh, one of the worst expressions online mm -hmm. is occasioned by uh, the anonymity mm -hmm. that then allows people to pollute <sighs> without any um, sense of responsibility or accountability mm -hmm. for what they say and how they say it. Right, right. Um, you just described, uh, and it's something that I'm going to really take away and reflect on as part of this uh, in the uh, after this conversation, is the really thoughtful approach to making sure that while you're not seeking anonymity, in some ways you've created um, you've created this uh, a buffer in yeah, some ways um, between young pueblo uh, because ego pride, vanity, mm -hmm. even in instances where you believe and know that you are helping people, sometimes- Oh, it the, gets in there. Right, Yeah. Uh, with all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a constant uh, battle. In, in the final few moments um, that we have, you are, your story, um, you know, the, the child of Ecuadorian immigrants, mm -hmm. um, in, in the way you have lived uh, your life and, and what you're doing with the intention of compassion. What makes you hopeful in the face of a mm. global pandemic and economic meltdown, racial strife in the United States, notwithstanding all of those um, realities? Mm -hmm. um, why is Diego Perez hopeful? Honestly, I think the, the thing, the idea that really keeps me going and that helps me see the light at the end of the tunnel is that I really think that this moment in history is so, because there are always challenges, right? There's always going to be some difficulty that we have to overcome. But this moment in history in particular, there has never been so much accessibility and we can still go a long ways in regards to making these things more accessible but there are more tools that you can use to literally heal your mind to deal with whatever trauma or past pain whatever uh, history that's been encoded in your mind and body that's causing a lack of clarity to decondition that and help you see the world in a much more loving and much more clear way so not only can you make yourself happier, but you can, through practice, figure out a way to harm yourself and other people less. And to me, that just gives me a sense of excitement and hope because that's, that hasn't existed before. You know, there are so many different ways to meditate, so many valuable, so many different traditions that can actually give you real results. And not only that, but... Um, you know, Western therapy has 
given so much to people where you can literally find someone who's trained professional to work with, to help you just overcome whatever it is that's challenging you in the moment. And, and beyond that, there are so many other healing modalities that I hear about regularly that um, healing modalities that are actually giving people results. And I think we haven't had that before. And we're going to see the results of that ripple outward in very big ways. Because when you start really deepening your radical honesty with yourself, when you start deepening your acceptance of what you're coming across, you are going to get much more creativity and a much more sense of balance, uh, a new ability to be a little more objective than before. That's going to help you just show up in the world in a whole different way. And not just on the interpersonal level, because it takes very, very many human beings with individual lives to come together to create society. And when more and more of us are able to heal ourselves and show up as a better version of ourselves, that's going to help us <clears throat> take whatever social project that we want to put forward, whatever way that we want to really see the world move in in the future, it's going to help us be so much more effective than before so that we don't mess it up with our own past. Because when I study history, there are so many people who, you know, go into their social projects or whatnot with good intentions, but then because they never healed themselves, they end up messing it up along the way. It's so easy to recreate the thing that harmed you when you don't deal with it. But we're going to be one of the first generations globally um, because, you know, these, a lot of these techniques have existed in India for so long, but now they're so widespread around the world. So globally, we're going to have so many people who are just going to know how to process their own pain in a healthy way. And that's going to help us just take this human experience to another level. Uh, hopeful wisdom uh, from Diego Perez. Uh, Diego, on behalf of the entire Wisdom 2.0 community, uh, thank you for your work. Thank you for your words. Thank you for how you show up. And thank you for Young Pueblo. Thank you so much, David. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Good. Take care.